I'm just starting a starting a series on uh, prayer, and the title of today's message is the prayer of repentance and Con confession. So, I think since this is a series on prayer, let's start uh, off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this time and opportunity to be able to study your word, uh, Lord, for your word to challenge us, for your word to convict us, for your word to transform us, and for your word to guide us and lead us. And so we pray, Lord, that as we study your word this afternoon, Lord, that you would speak to us and that you would help us, Lord, most of all, not just to listen to your word, but to be able to do uh, your word as well. And so we commit this time into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'd like to, as we start this series on prayer, I'd like to uh, just call us uh, into a, a season of prayer, uh, especially uh, in these weeks and in these days uh, as and in these months as Fairview Church looks to call a new lead pastor uh, to lead the church. I think it's so vitally and critically important for us to be able to dive deeper into prayer. Uh, this is a call to seek the Lord, a call to examine our lives, a call to fellowship with him, a call to pray for others, and a call even today to repent and turn to the Lord's, to the Lord. At a, at a time of destruction uh, and ruin in Israel's history, the prophet Joel called the children of Israel to the Lord, to repentance. In uh, Joel chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, Announce a time of fasting. Call the people together for a solemn meeting. Bring the leaders and all the people of the land into the temple of the Lord your God and cry out to him there. And it's so important in these days, uh, as Fairview Church is, is, is on the precipice of a new season, uh, on the precipice of calling a new pastor and seeking what the future uh, would be for Fairview Church and uh, understanding the wonderful experiences of the past and looking forward to the wonderful and amazing experiences of the future, it's so important to be able to pray. And the foundation of that starts with confession and repentance. And so today I want to look at two specific prayers of repentance and confession and learn four things from them. Although there's so much more than four things that you can learn from these uh, prayers. Uh, but I, so I'd like to encourage you to read these prayers on your own as well and study them and spend some time meditating uh, on these portion of scriptures. And the two prayers that we're going to look at is uh, David's prayer of personal repentance and confession, which is found in Psalm 51, which Ted read for us. And Daniel's prayer of corporate repentance and confession found in Daniel chapter 9. And we didn't read that yet. We'll quote some scriptures uh, this afternoon from there. But I encourage you as well to take some time to read that prayer and read the context of that. Now, David had failed the Lord and had committed adultery uh, in order to cover up uh, his adultery. He committed murder, right, when he killed Uriah the, the Hittite. And the Lord sent the prophet Nathan to David to confront him about his sin. And when he acknowledged his sin and his failure, he turned to the Lord in repentance. Although Daniel was a holy man, not this Daniel, the Daniel in the Bible, right? Uh, Daniel, it, it's, it's hard to find uh, fault with anything that he did in the Bible. Yet, Daniel, on behalf of the people of Israel, prayed a prayer of corporate repentance, acknowledging the sin of Israel, and turning uh, to God, right? They were, Daniel prayed this prayer of repentance and said, we have turned away from God. And we've rebelled against his commandments. And he prayed this corporate prayer of repentance to help Israel to turn back to the Lord. So let's look at both of these prayers and learn, learn a few things about repentance and confession, both in a personal sense, but also in a corporate sense as well, personally for each one of us and corporately for the uh, Fairview Church or the church as a whole as well. But before that, let me tell you a story of a man named Des. Nikki Gumbel tells the story about Des, who was radically changed uh, by an alpha program. Uh, Des was, was addicted to cocaine. He was a bouncer at a nightclub, which led to more and more violent tendencies and more and more into drugs and drinking. And one night, he overdosed. And in that moment, he cried out to God 
because he didn't want to die. And the next day he woke up and he didn't want cocaine anymore. He had a, a day job at a store and there was a lady there named Fiona and, uh, and she would share the love of God with him. And she shared with him about the saving power of Jesus. And she gave him a Bible to read. And he asked, he asked her, Fiona, out on a date. And she said no. And he kept asking. And she kept saying no. But he kept reading his Bible, uh, the Bible that she gave him, and realized that it was God who was working in his life and who helped him actually give up cocaine. And so he asked Fiona if she would take him to her church. And so she did. And he heard about an alpha program uh, that was starting. And so he decided to go to that alpha program. He found it so welcoming and open to any types of questions. And it helped him to think deeply about faith. And so he wondered how he could be forgiven for all of the terrible and the bad things that he had done. But as he journeyed in that session of alpha, the group really changed his outlook on who Christians were because of their sense of family and community and the love that they shared with him. And finally, he ended up committing his life to Christ and he has been changed. He had this, this time of repentance and confession and turning to the Lord. He eventually ended up marrying Fiona and they have a child. And now he's running an alpha program as well, calling it an alpha program from gangs to grannies. And it's a wonderful testament of what God can do to change lives by his grace as we repent and turn to him. So what is repentance? I'd like, to, I'd like to offer us a way of studying these two prayers to be able to say that repentance is to remember, to recognize, to request, and to receive. These four things let's look at. Remember, recognize, request, and receive. So the first is to remember the greatness of God. See, we can turn towards people, towards community, towards loved ones, towards friends, but ultimately the only person who can help us is God. And we need to recognize this. We need to come to a place of acknowledgement that he is the creator and he is the solution for all of our problems. And David said this in Psalm 51, verse one, have mercy upon me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sin. See, David was able to recognize the unfailing love of God. He was able to recognize the mercy of God. He was able to recognize the great compassion of the Lord. He invokes these things in his prayer of repentance. He realizes the greatness of God and realizes the need for God's mercy in this situation. He recognizes the unfailing love of God and his great compassion that it doesn't matter what we've done. His love never fails and his compassion is great towards us. Daniel, in a similar sense, in Daniel 9, verse 4, he said, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O oh Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love. Here, here Daniel speaks about God's covenant-keeping nature and also recognizes, similar to David, God's unfailing love. Oftentimes, people uh, fail or resist in turning towards God because they think that he is a God of wrath. Or, or will be displeased in what uh, they've done. And, and, and it can't be further from the truth. It's not about how uh, bad or how terrible we are, because God is a God of love with unfailing mercies and great compassion. God, in God's love, he's waiting for us to acknowledge him and turn towards him. It's so important to realize that the sin is against God. And that's what makes it all the more grievous, all the more weighty. It's a sin against God. In as much as David sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba, here he acknowledges that his sin was actually against God. Psalm 51 verse 4, against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. There, there was an acknowledgement of the gravity of the sin because it was against God, the ever-living creator. Daniel, in a similar sense, in verse 9, Daniel 9, verse 5 said, but we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. 
See, part of remembering the greatness of God is understanding that our sin is against the living God. And if it's against the living God, then how great in magnitude is that sin? It's, it's a huge thing. It, it, is our, it is our relationship between God that has been broken. And that needs to be restored. When we realize and acknowledge that, there is so much power. Recognize God's greatness. And in recognizing his greatness, let's acknowledge that we have sinned against God. It makes the gravity of our sin so great, but all the more so wonderful that Jesus forgives. The second thing is to recognize our sin. In our culture today, this is something that's very difficult to do. Because we want to be accepting and affirming and welcoming of everyone, but at the same, and which is good, we want to be welcoming for everyone. But we have to also be able to call sin, sin. And if we can't do that, then where's the place of forgiveness? Where is the place of reconciliation if there's no separation? Where's the place of healing if there's no brokenness? Where is the place of unity if there's no division or peace if there's no trouble or mercy if there's no failure? Where is the place of grace if there's no transgression? And so this first step is to recognize sin, to call sin, sin. And the word of God clearly delineates what is sin. And we have to be able to stand for the truth of God's word. Only unless we acknowledge sin can we really realize the fullness of God's unfailing love and realize the fullness of his compassion because if you don't call sin sin then what's the need of compassion what's the need of forgiveness what's the need of healing what's the need of mercy we need those things because we are sinners in need of God's grace in order to experience the fullness of God's love the fullness of his mercy the fullness of his compassion the fullness of his forgiveness then there needs to be an acknowledgement on our part of our need that we have fallen short or have not met the standard of God's glory. Psalm 51 verse 3 and 4 says, For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. See, repentance is turning away from your sin and turning towards God. But to turn away, there first must be an acknowledgement of sin. We're all sinners in need of God's grace. The Bible says that we've all sinned. That part is clear. The next step is for us to acknowledge it. In a very personal way, we need to confess our sin to God and acknowledge the areas that we need his help. And I want to encourage uh, the congregation, I want to encourage each of you friends to take some time with the Lord, even this week, to spend some time in prayer and acknowledging our sin, acknowledging the ways we failed against the Lord in repentance and in confession. And in a corporate way, we also need to acknowledge the sin of a nation, the sin of a church, the, the sin of us corporately. Daniel 9, verse 5 and 6, Daniel praying again, this corporate prayer of repentance, he said, but we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. See, each of us have failed individually against the Lord, but corporately, there are many times that we have failed. Maybe there have been times when, when Fairview Church has failed and, and you feel like the church has failed you. Well, we need to repent. Maybe there are times when you think, oh, I wish Fairview Church was like this or Fairview Church did that or Fairview Church reached out this way. And maybe you, you feel like, oh, I wish that they had done this and this. And maybe as a church, we have failed. Let me say, at, as, as, at the Big C Church, the larger body of believers not just Fairview Church, but the church as a whole has failed in many ways in being an example and reflection of Christ. We failed in many ways to actually reflect the true meaning of Christianity and the true message of the gospel. For example, even recently uh, in the news of the, the, the failure of the residential school system, the, the execution of the residential school system that was run by in conjunction with church, uh, the church and the government. 
And there are various churches. It might not be in, uh, the Church of God or Fairview Church, but the Catholic Church, the United Church, the Anglican Church, others. But the church as a whole received a stain in the way that they operated because there was so much hurt and pain and sadly, even death. Instead of sharing the love of Christ, the big C church, the church as a whole, we separated families, killed children, destroyed generations from knowing the love and compassion of Christ. This afternoon, I want to acknowledge the indigenous people of Canada, and specifically even in this area where uh, Fairview Church is in, in North York, the area where it's situated belongs to the traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat people and the Seneca people and the Haudenosaunee people. And that was traditionally their land that has been now taken over. The spirit of Christ should cry out within his people to show kindness and love and compassion while seeking for justice when many times there have been injustices in the past. And so we as a church, the big C church, the, the corporate body of the church, who should have been a reflection of Christ, have failed. And it's not just in the residential school system, but there's so many stains on a religious system that has been apart from Christ that has not reflected the, the love of Jesus. As we look at maybe back at the Crusades and so many other things in historical Christianity, where we look at that and we say, how could Christians have done that? Well, we are part of that, that we need to repent and turn to the Lord as Daniel did. And as he led Israel, Daniel himself didn't do anything wrong, but he included himself and said, we have rebelled. We have failed. And I think it's, it's good for us as, uh, as part of the body of believers to say, yes, that the big C church, we have failed in ways. And Lord, we turn to you. We ask that you forgive us and help us to do better. In Daniel 9, verse 20, he says, I, I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord, my God, for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. I know I have failed personally as a pastor. And maybe there are times when I should have called people and I didn't or visited people I didn't or prayed for people and I didn't. I know that in me, the humanity of, in, in, in me has failed in so many ways and fashions. And I look to the Lord for his uh, forgiveness. And corporately, as a body of believers, there's so many times when we have failed to show the love of Jesus and to, 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 to cry out for justice and to speak up for those that don't have a voice. And to do our part to make Christ's love known. And so let's take time to turn to the Lord in all those areas. Just as, as David turned to the Lord in a, in a very personal way. But Daniel, sinless as he was, but he included himself in that part of Israel. As part of his people that said, Lord, we have failed. Lord, we need to do better. So please help us. Number three is to request cleansing and forgiveness. This is what really sets Christianity and Jesus apart from everyone else in every other religion, is the fact that the God of all the universe came down to earth to die so that we could be forgiven. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful that the creator God would come down to earth and die on the cross so that you and I can be forgiven? This is what gives us wonderful hope. This is what offers the opportunity for us to acknowledge our sin because we know that there's hope and forgiveness offered by Jesus as we come acknowledging our sin. David, after acknowledging God's greatness and his great failure, asked for cleansing and forgiveness, and we can do the same. Psalm 51 verse 2, wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. Verse 7 says, purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 14 says, forgive me for shedding blood because he did shed blood. He ordered the, the murder execution of Uriah. But he says, forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Sadly, we live in a world right now where cancel culture has become the dominant thing. There's no room for mercy or forgiveness in cancel culture. If you've done something wrong in your past, even if it's 20 years ago, you're doomed. 
there's no forgiveness. It'll be trudged up. They'll, they'll find it out. He said, you did this 20 years ago and that's it. You're, you're doomed for the rest of your life. It's the cancel culture that we're living in today that's being propagated and growing and growing. There's no room for forgiveness. There's no room for mercy. There's no room for compassion. Thankfully, because of Jesus, there's forgiveness, there's grace, and there's love. In a corporate sense, Daniel asked for forgiveness for his whole people. Daniel 9 and verse 19 says, O Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act for your own sake. Do not delay. Oh, my God, for your people and your city bear your name. He called to the Lord for forgiveness. Thankfully, we have an opportunity because of the loving grace of Jesus, because of Calvary, we can acknowledge our sin and we can say, I messed up. I messed up 20 years ago. Lord, please forgive me. And there's love and grace and forgiveness because of that. We can always come to the Lord to receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. The last thing, number four, is to receive new life. When we turn away from sin and turn towards God, it is to start in newness of life. It is to say no to the old way of life and, and yes to this new way of life. It, it's, it, in step one, if you remember, we talked about recognizing the greatness of God. We saw how God was a, a covenant-keeping God. Covenant keep, this covenant-keeping aspect of God we looked at. And this, again, is the, the new covenant that God makes with his people to make all things new, to give us a, a new heart and a new mind to cleanse us. This is receiving new life. David says it this way in Psalm, uh, in Psalm 51. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. And in verse 12, he says, restore to me the joy of salvation and make me willing to obey you. There's this newness of life that comes. When, when Jesus came into, that, into Zacchaeus' house, Zacchaeus, who was a, a tax collector and a fraud, and he, he defrauded so many people and cheated so many people. When Jesus came into Zacchaeus' house, at the presence of Jesus, at the acknowledgement of the Savior, he repented from his theft and stealing. And, and he decided to make restitution. He said, half of the goods, uh, I'm going to give up. Half of my goods, I'm going to give to the poor. And to those who stole, that he stole from, he said, I'm going to give back fourfold the amount. See, there was new life. There's newness of life, new hope. It's like, I'm changing around. I'm not going to be the same old person, but I'm going to be somebody new. When people came to John the Baptist to be baptized, he told them to show and demonstrate works that reflected their repentance, that reflected their change of life. He said, don't just come to me the way you are. I want to see these works, these demonstrations of fruits of repentance, that there's an actual change in life. And maybe there, there are things that we've been doing or ways that we're walking or things that we've done in the past. And we need to make a stark difference and say, Lord, I repent. Please help me. And by your grace, Lord, let me be different. Let me receive newness of life. Verse 17, David says, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repented heart, O God. See, the result of repentance is a change in attitude a change in our heart. For Daniel, he realized when Daniel was praying this prayer, the, the whole reason Daniel started this whole corporate prayer of repentance, he realized that the 70 years of captivity that Jeremiah the prophet had spoken about, prophesied about, written about, was almost coming to completion. It was almost finished. And realizing it was coming to a completion, Daniel prayed this prayer of repentance for restoration. And he prayed and he looked to the Lord and asked the Lord to restore Israel, to give them another chance in serving and following the Lord because they had failed. And so Daniel prayed this prayer of repentance and confession with hope of newness of life, with hope that Israel would be restored back to the promised land as Jeremiah had prophesied about. He prayed this prayer to, to have new life. People of God, friends, how are we? going to respond to the call of repentance and confession.
As we come to him today, acknowledging our sin, acknowledging our failure, acknowledging our iniquity, acknowledging our transgression, there's newness of life for us. There is new life that the Lord wants to impart to us. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, it says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. and The new life has begun. Friends, God invites us. Jesus invites us to repentance and confession, to acknowledgement of our sin, so that we can experience the fullness of his love and grace and forgiveness and bring us in to newness of life. Whether this is in a personal sense, or maybe this is in a corporate sense for Fairview Church, whatever it might be, let's look to the Lord and ask the Lord to renew us. Oh Lord, revive us as in the days of old. Oh Lord, refresh us. Oh Lord, renew us. Oh Lord, do something new as we come to you in repentance and confession and in looking to you for forgiveness of our sins and in corporate repentance, coming to you for help in time of need. Let me close by telling you the story of a man named Nicky Cruz. You might have heard of him. From the age of about three and a half, Nicky Cruz was regularly beaten. At the age of nine, he attempted suicide after several beatings. He was one of 19 children born to parents who practiced witchcraft in Puerto Rico. His mother was a witch and his father was a satanic priest. Once um, his mother called him the son of Satan. But at the age of 15, his father sent him to New York City to live with his brother. He soon left his brother and decided to live on the streets of New York City. By the age of 16, he was part of one of the most ruthless gangs called the Mau Mau's. Within six months, he became their warlord or their president. And other gangs and even the police were fearful of them. And his life just kept getting more and more violent. His best friend, Manny, was stabbed and killed, and, and he bled out in Nicky Cruz's arms. Then one day, Nicky Cruz met David Wilkerson, who was called from being a country preacher to New York City to preach the gospel in that place. And David Wilkerson showed Nicky Cruz something that he had never experienced in his life before, and that was love. Nicky beat up David Wilkerson, Nikki spat on him, Nikki threatened his life, but Wilkerson wouldn't give up pursuing Nikki Cruz with the love of God. Wilkerson said, and these are some quotes from Nikki Cruz's website as he talks about this transformation that occurred in coming to Jesus. Wilkerson said, quote, you can kill me and cut me into a thousand pieces and throw them right there on the street, but Every piece will cry that Jesus loves you, Nikki. Can you believe the boldness of David Wilkerson to share the love of God to this gang warlord? Nikki said, quote, one night against all odds, he writes about this experience and he says, one night against all odds, Jesus Christ broke through the walls that surrounded Nikki's heart. Nikki describes it as if he had been admitted to a Holy Ghost hospital. As Nikki lies there vulnerable, Jesus walks to his side, opens Nikki's chest, takes out his heart, and puts it to his lips to kiss it. The Lord then placed the transformed heart back into his chest and raises him up as a brand new creation. Nikki was changed. It was amazing. You can read the story in the book, The Cross and the Switchblade, uh, or also Nikki Cruz's own biography called Run, Baby, Run. And he talks about the day that Jesus broke through his heart and his heart was broken and he repented and he confessed his sin and turned to Jesus as he was pursued with the relentless love of God demonstrated by David Wilkerson to him. Nikki Cruz then became an evangelist as well, and he started sharing the love of Jesus to millions worldwide. For the last 60 years, Nikki Cruz has been sharing the love of God because his life was transformed by the love of Jesus, and he became a new creation. And his book, Run, Baby, Run, has been translated to over 40 languages. And as I mentioned, his story is told in the book and also the movie, The Cross and the Switchblade.
Such a wonderful story of life transformation, such a wonderful story of repentance and conviction and turning away from sin and turning to God, turning away from a terrible lifestyle and turning to God in acknowledgement and saying, Lord, I need you to change me. Lord, I need you to transform me. Lord, I need you to do something new in my life. And it's amazing to see a brand new life that Nikki Cruz had, not what he had grown up with, not what he was living on the streets, but something completely different that God had brought him into because of the love of Jesus. Friends, the Lord is inviting us today to come to the altar. Seek him. Find him. Come to that altar today. Let's come to the altar in, in a virtual sense since we're gathered online. Let's, let's come to the altar and let's worship the Lord in repentance. And in confession, as we sing this song, we'll come to the altar. Let's acknowledge our sin. Let's acknowledge the ways we failed. Personally, corporately, and let's turn to Jesus with all of our heart because he wants to forgive. And he wants to create newness of life in us. Let's look to Jesus at this time. Let's sing uh, together. We'll come to the altar and let's worship the Lord and let him transform us and change us as we turn to him. God bless you.